Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. My name's Thomas. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. In a previous episode, we went on a dreamy excursion into Sherwood Forest, where we spent an enchanting evening listening to stories by the fire with Robin Hood and his band of merry outlaws. Tonight, we'll get to go back to that secret glen deep in the English woods. The season has changed and there are new tales to be told. Luckily, you'll have the best seat by the fire for the entire evening. I've also created an expanded soundscape to accompany the scenes of this tale, so I hope you can feel even more immersed in the story. And by the way, if you missed our first enchanting visit to Robin Hood's hideaway, don't worry. This one will be just as enjoyable, and you can always go back and listen to the first one at a later time. Both were beautifully written by Alicia Stephan. Now, my friends, close your eyes if you haven't done so already, and just allow your breathing to slow down to a pace that feels relaxed and reassuring to you. You may need a little extra help to let go of niggling thoughts that often play on our minds at night. So, just try to picture yourself outside on a warm, sunny day, looking up at the sky and watching the gentle clouds float by. That scene is just like your mind. The ever-present blue sky, dotted with clouds as they move by, just as your mind observes the thoughts that come and go, as if drifting on a breeze. Separate any sense of those thoughts being intrinsically part of you, and simply become the observer. Whatever thoughts present themselves, you can just smile and watch as they drift by, as if they were clouds in that beautiful blue sky. Even if you feel a heavy burden of thought, your mind remains the observer, just as the sky remains ever-present behind the clouds. Eventually, all clouds float away, out of sight, and the sky becomes clear. Let your breathing steadily continue at a natural pace while you enjoy tonight's story. And now, picture a quiet afternoon in late autumn when the first hint of winter is just barely noticeable in the air. This is where our story begins. (laughs) 
you are standing on a country road that winds through the depths of the English forest. You sense that you've been here before. Although the season has changed and the scenery is different, you recognize this as Sherwood Forest, where you once had an adventure in your dreams. Finding yourself in this familiar place, you are filled with happiness and anticipation. How many nights had you wished to return here? How many times, as you drifted off to dreamland, had you fervently hoped to find yourself once again making your way to Robin Hood's secret enclave? Tonight, you are finally being rewarded with another visit. It's late in the autumn. You can see that from the mood of the forest. Where it once embraced you with fresh leaves and wildflowers, it now stands regally with silent beauty. Now that it's stripped of the lavish decorations of spring, you can feel its steadfast wisdom. As the woodland trees and animals prepare to slumber for the winter, nature invites you into its calming embrace. Turning from the road, you follow a familiar winding trail into the trees. The canopy of leaves that sheltered this path in the summer is gone. With only a few exceptions, millions of them have let go of their branches in shades of red, brown, and gold. Now that they are in deep piles on the woodland floor, the bright sunshine reaches through the bare trees from overhead. It slants downward, causing the trees to stand in stark relief against the blue sky. The aura it creates is golden, but not warm, a trick of the eye. You can tell that someone has been walking this way through the forest. At least enough feet have trod here that the leaves are visibly pushed to the side. You are thankful for those who've gone before you, because you'll be able to follow the trail better. Even so, there are more leaves drifting into your path with every passing moment. They make a soft, shushing sound as you walk. The deliciously crisp air is bracing. You breathe deeply and it cleanses your lungs filling your nose with the wonderful smell of fallen leaves. You feel invigorated, but, oddly, you are not cold at all. You pass through a strand of silver birch trees. Like a work of art, they soar collectively into the air creating vertical lines of light and shadow. Looking down near the ground, you see some of their trunks dotted with red toadstools. They are the perfect whimsical decoration 
for these elegant grey and white giants. The smallest branches move ever so slightly in the breeze, making a faint sound as if the forest is singing all around you. The trail you're following moves beyond the birch trees to an area of thick underbrush. Holly bushes add an unexpected burst of colour. Their verdant green leaves are spotted with cheerful red berries. Although you walk quietly, the rustling of the leaves under your feet sends a pair of robins flying out of the bush next to you. They soar upward, and you watch their silhouettes as they flap their wings against the sky. You begin to hear the sound of a waterway up ahead. A river comes into view with a beautiful cascading waterfall. The water runs more sluggishly now than it did in the summer as parts of the river are beginning to freeze. The result is no less beautiful, however. At the sight of the patchy ice and the swirling, dark pools of water, you feel a delicious shiver of anticipation. Winter will be here, very soon. You find large, flat stepping stones that lead to the other side. They are grey and smooth and free of ice. Hopping lightly from one to the other, you confidently make your way across. You have a feeling it will not be long until you reach your destination, and you're hoping there is a warm drink awaiting you. As you follow the winding trail through more holly bushes, you wonder if they are sheltering any sleeping hedgehogs. The temperatures are cold enough now for the rotund little animals to be hibernating under them. You're a little tempted to go exploring in the leaves and find out, but you know that this would be extremely inconsiderate to the slumbering forest creatures. You are after all, a privileged visitor. Lifting your chin with dignity, you smile to yourself and walk on. High up in the sky, you see some of the smooth tree limbs bearing crowns of mistletoe. A flock of finches takes to the air, forming little shadows against the light. There is safety in numbers in the winter woodland, and they will forage together for seeds and berries. You turn and once again face the winding trail ahead of you. A light breeze blows a little cyclone of brown leaves across your path, as numerous as the tiny feeding birds above your head. Within moments, a few paces farther on, 
a beautiful red fox appears in the road. Unafraid, it sits right in the center of your path and curls its tail around its feet. It regards you with its intelligent, glittering eyes as you freeze in place. You don't move. You hardly exhale for fear of scaring away the beautiful wild creature. It turns and begins to trot down the path ahead of you. Without hesitation, you follow. For a time, you are trailing the fox. It weaves gracefully between boulders and up and down dips in the path. It hops over protruding tree roots. However, even as you focus on keeping pace with your animal guide, you're distracted by the haunting strains of music. Yes, you can identify the sound of a harp, a drum, a flute. You stand and look around you in the woods. When you turn your gaze back to the path, the fox is gone. A burnt orange leaf dances across your path, sailing gaily on a gust of chilly November wind. You confidently increase your speed on the trail, heading straight for the source of the music. You walk around a few boulders, then under some low-hanging tree branches. Finally, you deftly traverse the last few steps, and then you are there. Robin Hood's hidden camp in the forest opens up before you. The sight of it almost takes your breath away. This secluded glen manages to have a feeling of cozy secrecy, even though it is a rambling and impressive settlement. You wonder to yourself if you should even call it a camp. It's more a collection of tree houses and tents than it is a village, to be sure. But it feels like such an organic part of the woodland that it has an undeniable permanence. This is no fly-by-night campground. No, it feels as if it has been here a hundred years and will be here for a hundred more. There is an undercurrent of excitement coursing through the area. You can feel it. It's not a party exactly, but people are bustling to and fro in preparation for what appears to be a feast. A group of Robin Hood's men are tending to some horses off to the side, and there are several robed figures who appear to be holy men standing in a group nearby. Some of the capable ladies of the camp are directing them towards benches that encircle a roaring bonfire. Meanwhile, a robust bearded man in green 
appears to be warmly welcoming these mysterious looking men to his feast. You know by the host's rakish stance and the familiar twinkle in his eye that he is none other than Robin Hood. You feel a bit shy about intruding, but you don't need to worry. Within moments, one of Robin Hood's men has spotted you, and he waves amiably as if you're an old friend. Then he motions to the seats by the fire. You recognize him from your last visit many months ago. It's as if no time has passed. You are welcomed back into the fold. You nod your head in thanks and make your way to the company seated at the heart of the encampment. Before you even have a chance to speak, someone has draped a soft brown blanket over your shoulders and handed you a warm mug of a drink that smells delicious. Even though you were not feeling uncomfortably cold before, A sense of fellowship and well-being envelops you immediately. You think to yourself how there is nothing more delicious than being by a crackling fire in the brisk autumn air. Robin notices you and issues a fond huzzah. He says it's so good to see you again, and that you've come at the perfect time. Motioning to the robed figures sitting across from you, he explains that he has just encountered these fine men of the church on the road, and that they have graciously agreed to donate some of their money to the poor. And as you know, Robin says, leaning towards you conspiratorially, we always treat our generous guests to the finest meal in all of Sherwood Forest, which, of course, they will gladly pay for with another portion of their funds. You smile into your mug at the joke, and Robin throws back his head and laughs unreservedly. The men in the hooded robes look at each other sideways and adjust their cows as if to block the autumn breezes. You take a sip of your hot drink and close your eyes happily as it warms your entire body. Looking around the camp, you're aware of the denizens of Sherwood settling in for the evening. A few young lads are having a spirited archery contest across the glen. One of them hits the bullseye and cries victory but his fellow bests him moments later by splitting his own arrow right down the shaft. Mock protests ensue, and the game devolves into a boisterous discussion. You turn and look across from you, and see that the men in the robes are watching the game intently, Although their faces are obscured, you could swear they are smiling. You're intrigued by one of the robed men in particular. 
he has a regal feeling about him. Although he wears no expensive crosses or jewelry, such as a pompous bishop might. Far from being angry about having been waylaid, his pockets emptied, he seems peaceful. You get the feeling he's enjoying himself. It is most puzzling, but you keep your questions to yourself and continue to observe. Your thoughts are interrupted by the serving of heaping plates of delicious food. The robed men are urged to enjoy, and they appear to dig into the feast with dignified vigor. You gratefully receive a plate that is handed to you by one of the friendly people tending the serving table. The aroma of the food, cooked over an open fire in the forest, is one of the best things you've ever smelled. You and the other guests sit quietly enjoying your dinner, while Robin and his band of followers converse, make jokes, and repeatedly raise their ample mugs in the name of justice and charity. The sun has gone down since your arrival, and now the firelight casts a flickering glow on the company sitting in a circle around it. You feel like you are losing track of time in a very pleasant way. A tawny owl hoots somewhere in the darkness. Or is it two owls? Just as you almost feel yourself slipping away from the moment, some activity at the edge of the camp pulls you gently back. A small band of men has arrived on horseback, and Robin Hood has eagerly approached them to issue a friendly welcome. A regal man in sober but expensive-looking clothing steps forward and bows his head to Robin in greeting. Robin claps the man's arm and calls him Sir Edward of the Lee, inviting him to the fireside to dine. Sir Edward thanks him and says that he has actually come with an urgent warning. My son, Sir Henry of the Lee, has been in town in the company of the Sheriff of Nottingham, who is entertaining none other than good King Richard. A murmur goes up through the shadows of the clearing it is quite an event to have King Richard visiting nearby, everyone whispers. Robin beams. Why, that is excellent news, he says. Our love for King Richard knows no bounds, and it is a great honor to have him near. Are there festivities in Nottingham? At this, Sir Edward shakes his head gravely. I'm afraid that is not the part of the news I rushed here to share, he adds. My son has been much in the king's company, 
and informs me that he is planning to appear on the road through Sherwood Forest in disguise. He is hoping your men will accost him, taking him for a rich clergyman. My son Henry fears that he will uncover the location of your camp and arrest you for thieving. I've hurried here to warn you, for as you know, I owe you and your men everything I have and will give you protection as long as I draw breath. Another murmur goes up around the camp, and you see one of the mysterious clergymen stand up at the fire and stride towards Sir Edward. It is the particularly magnetic figure you noticed earlier, who breaks away from the others to do this. As he walks, you notice that he is very tall, easily over six feet in height, and he moves with impressive dignity and grace. But he is also an imposing figure. He stands in front of Sir Edward and Robin Hood and draws back his head covering to reveal himself. Under the hood, you see that he is a handsome red-haired man with grey eyes and a well-manicured beard. You don't know him at first sight, but you are the only person present who does not instantly bow or take a knee. Your Highness, Robin utters reverently. King Richard, I had no idea it was you wearing this robe. Please forgive my men and me for waylaying you on the road. We live to serve you and love you above all others under God. We offer you our most humble fealty. Richard doesn't speak for a moment. It's so quiet, you could hear an acorn drop in the clearing. Nobody knows what he will say. Then he begins. Sir Edward, am I right to understand that you sought to outmaneuver me and snatch an outlaw from my grasp? You did this, even understanding that it was my wish to be brought to this camp. What am I to think of your act of disloyalty to the crown of England? How am I to view your alliance with a band of outlaws? You, a most honoured and privileged knight of the realm, Sir Edward, kneeling, protests that he does love the king and has no personal plot to subvert his wishes. However, he adds, he owes Robin Hood and his men a special debt and has pledged his loyalty to them. It is an oath he cannot break even if it means he should be arrested. King Richard seems unmoved by this plea. In fairness, you think to yourself, Sir Edward really needs to explain the story behind his oath of loyalty to Robin, because he has not made a very convincing argument in his own defence yet. Luckily, help appears to be on the way. 
another of the hooded clergymen reveals himself. He is a younger man, and not as tall as the king. However, you can see that he is strong and broad-shouldered and athletic. He also moves with the dignity of an aristocrat. This stout fellow walks boldly forward to the trio in the clearing, and dropping to one knee in front of King Richard, he speaks. Your Highness, I beg you to listen to my father's story. As a knight, I followed you in battle, sometimes saving your life, even as I risked my own time and again. I hope I have earned your trust. I promise, when you hear what Robin did for my father, Sir Edward of the Lee, you will agree that Robin Hood is a force for good, and that any knight deserving of the title would honor such an ally with his loyalty. Richard seems to be considering the younger man's words carefully. Then he responds. Sir Henry of the Lee, it is true. You are a brave and steadfast servant, and have been my faithful subject and protector in foreign lands. In recognition of that, I will consent to hear your father's story before making any judgments about his loyalty. The entire company in the glen appears to exhale with relief, and the mood lifts considerably. Robin smiles broadly and bows, indicating that there are seats waiting by the fire. Then, as the king, Sir Edward, and Sir Henry return to the benches there. The villagers begin to bustle about, pouring drinks and offering food. They know that they are all in for a good fireside story. Robin hops upon a large rock nearby and takes the demeanor of a master of ceremonies. His eyes twinkle, and you can tell that he relishes this challenge to win over the king with his tail. He begins speaking with a dramatic tone. Your Highness, it is probably best if the story begins with me. It has to do with a very sad and dejected knight we encountered at the crossroads one day, while we were taking a rest from our travels, and thoroughly minding our own business. He pauses as if to gain confirmation from his men, who are gathered about. They all nod at each other, as if to say, yes, that's exactly how it goes. Robin nods approvingly and continues. Now the road was not busy that day, and we had been quite alone. As we were finishing our refreshments, we heard the clopping of an approaching steed. A very fine lord appeared, all by himself. He was soberly dressed and without ornaments, but he had the demeanor of a man of wealth and honor. 
we looked at each other, my man and I, and we asked ourselves, who was this finely attired lord? But why was he without any expensive jewellery? Why did he ride with his head hanging, and so slowly, as if the weight of the world were on his broad shoulders? The assembled company murmurs briefly, and many take sips from their mugs. They wait eagerly for the story to continue. Well, in the most friendly way, we hailed the man and asked him, as we do all our friends on the road, if he had gold or other valuables to spare. It's natural for us to invite such important persons to dine here, as you know. They are generally amiable about parting with their wealth to do so. At this, Robin winks, and the company chuckles. You look at Sir Edward, and see that he makes no comment on this tale. He is not disputing the story, although he also does not contribute. Robin goes on. The man, who turned out to be Sir Edward here, told us that, sadly, he had no money or jewels. None at all. And we were very sceptical, for how could such a fine man, on such a beautiful horse, claim poverty? Animated chatter again breaks out among the people around the fire. Everyone obviously agrees that this is a most unusual circumstance. Robin continues his tale. Naturally, we politely asked him to let us turn out his saddlebags and his pockets. You see, we had to know if he was trying to pull the wool over our eyes, or perhaps he'd forgotten about something he'd packed in his luggage. You laugh lightly into your mug, joining the feeling of mirth at this little joke. Robin waits for the humorous moment to pass, and then goes on. Well, imagine our surprise when we found that he was telling the truth. The man had no coin on him whatsoever. You'll not be surprised to hear that we asked him why he'd gone travelling and left all his riches at home. And do you know what he said? At this... Robin Hood pauses dramatically, arms spread wide, and waits for an answer from the crowd. Everyone waits with bated breath. He said, Alas, I have no money here or at my estate. My lands are all I have left in my possession, and I am sadly soon to lose them due to unpaid debts. A sympathetic murmur goes up from the assembled company. Looking at Sir Edward, you see that he is not disputing this revelation. Seeing that Sir Edward doesn't wish to take up the telling of the story, Robin continues it. It seems that Sir Edward had fallen on hard times, and in order to pay some debts, 
he had to pawn his lands to Prior Vincent of Emmet. A slightly scandalized whisper ripples through the people around the bonfire. One of Robin's men calls out from the shadows with the question that is on everyone's mind. But what caliber of knight would run up such debts with abandon? Surely that was a most irresponsible and debauched lifestyle he led to be brought so low. Before Robin can continue, Sir Henry of the Lee stands. His voice rings out amid the crowd, hushing their talk. Do not make such assumptions about my father, who is a wise and careful man. I will tell you how his debts came to be, through no fault of his own. Everyone around the fire refills their mug, takes a drink, or reaches for some food. There is a delightful new direction that the story is taking. You settle in to hear the tale as the attention turns to Sir Henry. I had recently returned from faraway lands where I fought honorably with King Richard, he begins. King Richard can be seen nodding in assent, confirming that the young man tells the truth. Henry continues. I came to Nottingham Town fresh from my journey and ready for some recreation. As you can imagine, I was perhaps a bit too eager to engage in boisterous entertainments in town. Here, Henry bows his head briefly and seems to be a little ashamed. But he continues... There was a wrestling match with numerous impressive competitors, and I boldly entered. It was just a bit of fun, but I underestimated the strength and skill I had acquired in these years at war, and as it turned out, I won every match. The people around the fire nod in eager approval. They are impressed. Another man calls out from the shadows, saying, Why was this a misfortune? It sounds like a great victory. Henry shakes his head. Unbeknownst to me, One of the men I bested was a clear favorite among many spectators. My victory in our match resulted in the loss of numerous large wages among some powerful men. They appealed to their crony, the Sheriff of Nottingham, and arranged for him to create false charges against me. A gasp goes up from the listeners. This is truly an outrage, but they know the sheriff is a man without morals and that he's done far worse. Henry continues. In order to avoid having me unjustly thrown in prison, my father had to reimburse all of the aforementioned men for their lost funds. To do so, he was forced to empty his coffers and also take a sizable loan from Prior Vincent. 
the collateral for that loan was his lands. Many expressions of sympathy are exchanged around the fire. It's now clear to everyone how it was that Sir Edward fell to such disadvantage. Seeing that his part of the story has been told, Henry sits down and bows his head. There is a reverent pause as the gravity of this plot twist sinks in. The fire crackles, and everyone instinctively holds their mug up to their face, letting the steam warm their cheeks for a moment. You pull the blanket tighter around your shoulders to shelter you from the crisp night air. You look into the fire and watch as a spark flies away from the flames and up towards the heavens. You hear the snapping of twigs as they are consumed by the flames. Then, as if a suitable time has elapsed, Robin picks the story back up. When we came upon Sir Edward on the road, he was only three days from having to pay back the loan on his lands. He had hardly a pound to his name, yet he owed four hundred. Although he planned to plead his case for more time, he felt fairly certain that the prior would refuse. In due course, he would be forced to sign his estate over to the unscrupulous clergyman. There are many expressions of sympathy heard around the fire. Robin pauses only briefly and proceeds. With great sympathy for his plight, we begged him to at least come back to our camp with us and share a good meal. Luckily, he agreed. Robin looks meaningfully around the circle and smiles broadly. Luckily, I say, because at that very same moment, Little John and Friar Tuck were also on their way back to our settlement. With them was the corrupt and bloated Bishop of Hereford, whom they had accosted on the road. As with all wealthy travellers, the fortunate bishop was invited to our fireside to empty his pockets and enjoy some dinner. At this, the crowd laughs. They are all familiar with the cost of a dinner in Sherwood Forest for those who are caught with ill-gotten funds. Robin claps his hands together and proceeds with his tale. The silks and jewels and money the bishop so generously provided us with were distributed among the needy. And it just so happens that our knight here was among the neediest on this occasion. In order for him to pay back his debts to Prior Vincent, and avoid being cast off his lands, we furnished him with four hundred pounds and a small company of men to protect him during his upcoming travels to the Priory. Having settled all of this, 
we then feasted in good fellowship with Sir Edward, and he was able to sit side by side with his unwitting benefactor, the bishop. The assembled company laughs and toasts the serendipity of the entire affair, proclaiming the solution to be a good one. At this moment, a new storyteller steps into the ring. He is an enormous man, tall and broad across the shoulders. He is an intimidating figure, but he has rosy cheeks and a kind smile. With a flourish of his hand, he bows and introduces himself as Little John, saying he will take up the tale from here. For it was I who travelled along with Sir Edward to his appointment with Prior Vincent, he calls out. A hush falls over the group as they prepare to hear how Sir Edward's affairs would resolve themselves. You look over at King Richard and see he is listening keenly, with the beginnings of a smile on his face. Little John begins speaking again. The very morning after the feast, we set off with Sir Edward. Meanwhile, it was decided that the good Bishop of Hereford would stay at our camp for a few days until the entire transaction had been completed. After all, we had so very many entertainments to share with him, and we didn't want him running to the sheriff and spoiling our plans. Everyone nods in agreement. This sounds very sensible. Off we went, travelling and resting as needed, with always a few men keeping watch. We carried quite a bit of gold with us, and didn't want to fall victim to unscrupulous highwaymen before reaching the Priory. Luckily, we encountered no scuffles on our journey. We were able to deliver Sir Edward to his audience with Prior Vincent. Here, Little John pauses and drums up some suspense, adding, Oh, and what a scene of debauchery we found there. A gasp runs through the crowd at the delicious scandal of it all. Little John goes on. The prior was not alone. He was feasting lavishly in his hall with the Sheriff of Nottingham at his side, as well as his other cronies. It was apparent that the sheriff was there to facilitate the speedy takeover of Sir Edward's land, for the prior had bragged to one and all that the knight should never be able to pay what he owed. Indeed, no thought was given for Sir Edward's honour or comfort. He was left to stand at the end of the table and not offered food or refreshment of any kind. I'm sure you'll all agree, this was very rude. The audience clearly agrees with this assessment, clucking their tongues and shaking their heads. Little John continues. 
the prior flatly asked Sir Edward if he'd come to pay what he owed. Sir Edward responded by pleading for the prior's understanding and asking for one more month to raise the money, as the harvest would soon be in. The prior, of course, told him that that was not possible, and that if he couldn't pay the debt, he would ask the knight to sign over his lands forthwith. A ripple of disapproval can be heard circling the fire. Then little John goes on. At this, Sir Edward made an impassioned speech, asking the prior how he could give so little kindness. He, a man of the cloth, and Sir Edward, an honourable knight, who had always conducted himself with decency. You look around the crowd and see many of the listeners gravely sipping from their mugs and nodding their heads. Little John pauses reverently and then begins speaking once again. In sheer mockery of Sir Edward, the prior said that if he could only pay two hundred pounds, they would call it even. Naturally, this was an attempt to further embarrass him, as he was quite sure Sir Edward didn't even have two hundred pounds. However, this was our moment of triumph for he had badly miscalculated with that move. The fireside listeners eagerly lean forward. They know what is coming. At this, Sir Edward politely thanked the prior for his godly charity, and motioned to one of our men, who had two bags of gold. Each one held two hundred pounds, and both bags had been sent in order to pay the four hundred pound debt. However, the prior had set a trap for himself. At this, Little John leans back and laughs heartily. I wish you could have seen his face when I poured out two hundred pounds on his table and he realised he'd been outmanoeuvred. And with the sheriff sitting right there, he couldn't go back on his word to release Sir Edward from his obligations. And so it was that an unscrupulous usurer was bested that day by Little John and Sir Edward. Best of all, the prior's other two hundred pounds was distributed to the poor, as it wasn't needed by the good prior. A cheer goes up among the revellers, celebrating the happy end to the story. But Little John is not quite done. And it must be said that the very next year, Sir Edward returned here to Sherwood Forest to repay the two hundred pounds he had applied to his debts, and with it brought a portion of his harvest to feed our families for the winter. All eyes turn to Sir Edward with admiration for his gentle behaviour. He nods humbly, and speaking for the first time since the story began, 
he says. I owe everything I have to Robin Hood and his men, which is why I've pledged to defend them with my life, if need be. It's why I came here to warn them, so they would not be arrested. Then he stands and bows towards King Richard, saying, Your Highness, I love and serve thee, and hope you can understand why I stood by that pledge. At this point, all the people around the fire seem to be holding their breath. Other than the hooting of an owl and the quiet popping of wood in the fire, there is no sound. All eyes are on King Richard as he stares at Sir Edward. His face reveals nothing of his thoughts. Then, all of a sudden, his eyes crinkle up at the edges, and he claps his hand upon his knee and laughs long and hard. Oh my, he says with mirth, that is indeed a swashbuckling tale. I wish I had been there to see the prior accept that two hundred pounds myself. The crowd erupts into excited talk and cries of huzzah at the king's words. Sir Henry drops his head into his hands in an attitude of relief, and Robin Hood claps Sir Edward jovially on the back. When the talk has died down, King Richard appears to wish to speak again. The truth is, he says, I was not coming here to arrest Robin Hood. I had heard such daring tales of the exploits in Sherwood Forest that I vowed to be kidnapped so I could meet these merry men myself. I must say, the feast and the fellowship made it very much worth my while. Then he pauses his arms outstretched, and says, Now, could there be some music and dancing to conclude the evening? After all, is it not time for the feast of Saint Cecilia, patron saint of musicians? Within seconds, The three resident musicians have struck up a lively tune, and the people of the glen are kicking up their heels in a joyful dance. Sir Edward stands conversing with his son Henry by the fire, as villagers ply them with refreshments. King Richard stands to the side of the clearing with his men, still in their robes, and taps his feet to the time of the music. Belying his enormous size, Little John has taken a partner and is displaying a surprisingly excellent sense of rhythm. You cuddle up under your soft blanket, with the glow of the bonfire warming you, and you feel totally surrounded by happiness.
After a few upbeat tunes, the music tends towards a slower, sleepier mood. As if on cue, large white snowflakes begin to drift through the clearing. At first, it is only one or two, and then, all of a sudden, they are falling and falling. The dancers turn in circles with their faces to the night sky, laughing with delight as this first sugary dusting of winter makes its appearance in Sherwood Forest. Like figures on a music box, the dancers glide in, out, around and around with mesmerizing grace. As you follow them with your gaze, you find that all the fresh air and the merriment have made you awfully tired. The cozy embrace of the outdoor hearth and your soft blanket cradle you in comfort. Your hands are warm on your mug you find that you feel as if you are almost outside of yourself, floating above the glen in a dream state. You know that tonight, the king, the knight, and the outlaws will sleep in this encampment in harmony with each other and with nature. How very lucky you are to be here too. As you watch the merry proceedings, a small movement catches your eye in the shadows cast by the firelight. Turning to look, you see the little red fox. It's sitting under the shelter of a nearby shrub, regarding you inquisitively. For a moment, your eyes meet. The wind keens softly and blows a few leaves across your view. Then, without any fuss, the fox turns and disappears into the forest with a flash of its tail. You smile and mentally offer it a fond farewell. Even though you don't want this evening to ever end, sleep is calling you too. Its pull is so strong that you think perhaps you will give in to these deeper dreams. As you float away, On a wave of drowsiness, the music playing softly, you find yourself making a silent promise to return again someday to magical Sherwood Forest.